Hello everyone, welcome to this course on supply chain digitization. This course is jointly being offered by myself, Professor Priyanka Verma, Professor Sushmita Narayana and Professor Deva Prata Das from IIM Mumbai. We are running into the first week and this is the fifth session of the first week module. And today we are going to explore the functions that we have discussed in previous sessions in detail. So, we are going to continue our discussions on the fundamentals of supply chain management. If we refer to the last uh, session, we have discussed about different supply chain processes. Uh, we started our discussions with uh, processes like planning and forecasting, sourcing and procurement, production and manufacturing, inventory management, distribution and logistics and customer services. In the last sessions, we discussed in detail about planning and forecasting sourcing and procurement and we briefly introduced about production and manufacturing. In today's session, we will cover the remaining processes in detail. Let us look into the process of production and manufacturing and let us try to review what we have done in our previous session. As far as you remember, we discussed about the role of technologies in production and manufacturing and that how when uh, how we, uh, the way we started using technologies in our production and manufacturing processes, how this is leading to a large amount of data which needs to be analyzed for proper decisions. We have also seen about the different uh, data analytics that can be done on this available data. Using this data, uh, we can take decisions related to predictive maintenance. The quality can be controlled using SPCs and different types of machine learning models. Followed by this, we can also follow look into root cause analysis of all of this data and the processes can be monitored very nicely using proper data analytics. Most importantly, in this process of production and manufacturing, it is important that we focus on certain KPIs which needs to be in uh, target throughout the uh, system, throughout the time so that uh, you are following it in a right manner. Some of the prominent uh, KPIs for production and manufacturing includes OEE, cycle time, throughput and capacity utilization. In order to demonstrate that how this can be calculated, let us try to understand it with the help of one example. So, we will be talking about a very simple example of how we will calculate capacity utilization and efficiency in a production environment. Let us look into an example of a company which is actually engaged in manufacturing different type of leather bags and they are trying to understand their capability. So, for this purpose, the data has been collected and it was found that in the last week, the uh, facility was able to produce around 1 lakh 2000 of leather bags whereas, the effective capacity is around 1 lakh 7500 for making the same type of leather bags. Followed by this some more data was captured and it was observed that the production line was able to operate for 7 days per week. So, that was the time you can see that the production line can work, but in this the shift uh, for which they can be uh, working in a working condition included 2 9 hour shift per day. So, you can sense that the production facility is working for 18 hours in a day. The production line has the capacity of making around 900 leather bags per hour. So, we can see from this very simple example that we have captured so many data points over here. And now it is very important that how do we use these data points to uh, decide about some of the KPIs and to keep a track on those KPIs. So, here we have to calculate certain important KPIs which are related to design capacity, utilization and efficiency of the plant. All these keywords are very important. So, in order to calculate these details, we are required to, uh, we should be knowing about three types of capacities over here. 
these are design capacity, effective capacity and actual capacity. So, let us try to understand what is the meaning of design capacity. When we talk about design capacity, it is a capacity for which the system is available to be operated. Whereas, when we talk about effective capacity, it is considered after excluding the planned resources unavailability. For example, if there is a plan for preventive maintenance or if there is a plan for some setups or changeover, then that is considered in calculating this particular capacity and that is why it is called as the effective capacity. Whereas, when you talk about the third capacity which is the actual capacity, you can see that this is this capacity is something which is very interesting and this is the actual capacity as it takes care of all the unplanned resource unavailability from the effective capacity which can include uh, scenarios like machine breakdowns which happen suddenly or maybe unavailability of some of the spare parts which are not in the control of the given processes. So, we have seen today three different types of capacity. One is the design capacity, the second one is the effective capacity and the third one is the actual capacity. Now, let us try to see that if we have these capacity information, how do I use this for calculating my utilization and efficiency for the given scenario. So, going forward, let us see the formula, uh, the formula for utilization and efficiency. When we look into the formula of utilization, you can see that the utilization is given by actual output versus the design capacity. Now, this is something very, very interesting. So, utilization is referred as actual output versus design capacity, whereas the efficiency is calculated as actual output versus effective capacity. So, the numerator you can see remains same which is actual output and but the denominator is changing for both utilization and efficiency. So, in case of utilization the formula is given as actual output divided by design capacity whereas, in case of efficiency the formula is given as actual output divided by effective capacity. Now, let us use this formula to calculate the utilization and efficiency for the given case. You can see that utilization is nothing but it is the percentage of the design capacity which is actually achieved. So, what you have what you are capable of to the maximum level what percentage of it you are able to achieve is uh, referred as utilization in a way you can say that. Whereas, efficiency is different than utilization, it is nothing but it is the percentage of effective capacity which is actually achieved. So, it takes care of all your planned uh, activities for calculating your capacity and from that effective capacity what percent of, of it is actually achieved is referred as efficiency. So, we are going to use these uh, two formulas over here. Let us see how a design capacity is calculated because the uh, facility works for 7 days, for 2 shifts and for 9 hours every day. We can say that the uh, facility is available uh, for 7 days, 2 shifts and 9 hours. This becomes the total available time plus every time it is making 900 leather bags per hour. This is also given as the capacity of the production line. So, when we multiply this together, we get our design capacity. So, using this we can say that over here we have around the, uh, the design capacity of the process is around 1,13,400 leather bags. Now, using this design capacity, let us calculate our utilization. Let us refer the old formula once again which is actual output by design capacity. Giving this formula over here, we have already been given with uh, the idea about the actual output which is around 1,2000 which is already given to us in the problem divided by the design capacity which is around 1,13400. So, this gives you the utilization as 89.9 percentage. Going forward, let us try to calculate the efficiency out of this which is nothing but the ratio of actual output 
versus effective capacity. So, putting this into the formula once again, we have been given with the actual output which is around 1 lakh 2000 leather bags and the effective capacity is given as 1 lakh 7500. So, following this formula, we can see that the efficiency for the given process is coming around 94.8 percentage. So, today we have learned that how capacity utilization can be calculated and how efficiency can be calculated using the design capacity and effective capacity and actual capacity how they are different from each other and using that how the KPIs can be calculated which are required to be monitored for ensuring that your production and manufacturing is proper. Going forward, we will uh, pick up the next process which is a very important process of supply chain and it is called as inventory management. When we talk about inventory, it is nothing but it talks about how much of the product is available on hand and along with that you also get to know about its location. So, if you are knowing the location of the quantity of the product, this helps in taking many decisions for managing your supply chain. In inventory management, it is important that you keep a balance between adequate merchandise on hand and also try to avoid holding the surplus stocks. So, what are the different famous inventory management techniques? Many of these techniques are well known. We are trying to list it over here for uh, 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 just to see a quick comparison of the different techniques for inventory management. The most prominent and most famous of inventory management technique is ABC analysis as you all know about it which depends upon classifying the product based on the importance of it or the value of it. So, here we can classify the product into three categories that is A category, B category or C category and this is one of the very well known technique for managing inventory and is being used at many uh, respective companies as well. The other way of inventory management technique is managing your safety stock which depends totally on how what is your lead time and what is the variability of your uh, lead time for managing your demand. The third one is called as economic order quantity which is EOQ and it totally depends on the combination of ordering cost and holding cost which in a way it tries to keep a balance between both of them. So, EOQ is again a very prominent technique for inventory management and the last one is the reorder point which is which ensures that products are available when they are needed. In line with this there are different KPIs for the inventory management as we all know and all the industries and all the businesses are required to keep a track of their inventory by using these KPIs. Some of these KPIs are which are very famous are referred as here as average inventory which is just the average of beginning inventory and the end ending inventory. Then we have inventory turnover ratio which is calculated as cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. Then we have stock out rate which is nothing but it is looking for the frequency and duration of shortage of inventory and customer satisfaction. Uh, then we have the inventory carrying cost which is calculated and it also takes care of the cost associated with the warehousing that is with the storage, insurance for the products to be stored, the labors which are associated with it and so on. The last one is the days of inventory on hand which is the value of average inventory divided by the cost of goods, goods sold for 365 days. So, these are some of the important KPIs for inventory management, but this is just a brief list which is shared over here. Uh, the different industries have the, their own KPIs which they keep tracking to ensure that products are managed efficiently. Let us see a quick uh, example of how these KPIs are calculated for the inventory management. We will talk about a case again and we will try to demonstrate that how these KPIs are being calculated. Let us assume that there is an online t-shirt boutique and they are trying to sell their t-shirts. So, here the t-shirts are being purchased from a supplier by the retailer and there are two distinct scenarios with different average inventory for a quarter period. 
So this information we have already calculated, we have already collected and we are going to analyze these two scenarios. Using these two scenarios we will try to find out the right policy for managing these inventories. So in the first scenario we can see that there is a lower average inventory. When we compare the cost of goods sold information along with the average inventory, we can see that in scenario 1, the cost of goods sold is given as 15 lakh rupees and whereas the average inventory is coming around 1 lakh 50 thousand rupees. Similarly, when there is higher average inventory, we can see that the cost of goods sold remains same which is around 15 lakh itself but the average inventory is uh, has increased and now it is now uh, it is uh, the value of average inventory is around 5 lakh rupees. So if we have been given with these two scenarios let us try to calculate the inventory turnover rate and analyze these scenarios to uh, find out the right strategy for a given quarter period. So remember this planning is done for a quarter period and all the information that is given over here is for a uh, time period of 3 months. Going forward let us see the solution. In case of lower average inventory that is your scenario 1, when we try to calculate our inventory turnover ratio the using the formula very simple formula that we have just seen, we uh, can calculate our turnover ratio which is a ratio of cost of goods sold and the average inventory value and this is com coming around 10 for the scenario 1. Similarly, we continued our calculation and did the calculation for the inventory turnover rate and because the planning was done for a quarter period which is equivalent to 90 days, we use this 90 days and then we are trying to find out that uh, what is the inventory turnover uh, rate for this time period. Uh, so this is given as 90 days divided by inventory turnover ratio and we got the value as 9 days. We did the similar analysis for scenario 2 also that is for higher average inventory value and then we found out that the inventory turnover ratio is coming as 3 and the inventory turnover rate for the scenario 2 is coming as 30 days. So let us analyze these numbers that what do you mean by inventory turnover ratio for this example and what do you mean by inventory turnover rate in this example. When we talk about inventory turnover uh, ratio it is nothing but it is trying to give us an information that it how many times your inventory is sold or used up to. So when it you are saying that the inventory turnover ratio is 10 it means that you have got a very high, uh, high turnover ratio and the inventory is sold at a very faster rate and that is why the inventory is used about 10 times per year. Whereas when we see about inventory turnover rate which is coming around 9 days for scenario 1, it simply indicates that for 9 days the company is able to sell or use up, it, it, up its inventory. It simply indicates that in this time period that is in a gap of 9 days, the company is able to sell all the available inventory and the company has to refill its inventory levels. So you can see that the scenario 1 is quite responsive because of very high inventory turnover ratio that is 10 which is higher than 3 as shown in scenario 2 and the number of days for which the inventory is sold or is in use is also very less for scenario 1 and it is just 9 days compared to scenario 2 which is around 30 days. So we can see that when we compared both the scenario 1 and scenario 2, we can see that when you are carrying lesser average inventory, there in this scenario you are able to carry your inventory for lesser number of days but your turnover ratio is very high. It simply means that you need to refill your inventory more number of times where your turnover rate is uh, very less. Whereas if you are carrying very high inventory, then the inventory turnover rate is high. It means you are carrying your inventory for more number of days, but the turnover ratio is very low, which means that you need to refill your inventory for lesser number of times. So using these 
logic you can easily decide that what is the right amount of inventory that needs to be carried to ensure that you are not missing any opportunity of fulfilling the demand requirement from the customer end. Going forward, let us see the third function of supply chain processes, which is again a very important uh, lifeline of supply chain and it is referred as distribution and logistics. When we talk about its role, it is all about ensuring that how product is made available to the customer and this particular processes ensures that the product is, uh, is available to the customers as per their requirements. Here in this process, lot amount of coordination is required starting from the activity of order management, then in between the processes which are executed at warehouses, followed by the inventory management and the transportation. As you can see that all these activities are very closely linked with each other and in this process, the customer is always expecting to see that the order is visible to the customer and in parallel, they are able to track the customer. Now, how does digitization is playing an important role in distribution logistics? So, we have, we can see that there are different ways in which the data can be captured from here. And in this case, we have, uh, we have the opportunity to do a lot of data analytics. Uh, the data analytics can be implemented in topics or in areas like route optimization, warehouse optimization, fleet optimization, inventory optimization and ensuring real time visibility. When we talk about route optimization, it is nothing but how you can analyze your historical traffic data and maybe some weather condition to ensure that you can optimize your delivery routes in real time. Another example of warehouse optimization is all about ensuring that how the space utilization is optimized, how you are deciding the product placement, picking process and so on. Similarly, in fleet optimization, decisions related to vehicle routes, routing, fuel consumptions, planning of the maintenance schedules and also reducing operational costs can be effectively done. So we can see that how data analytics is playing a very, very critical role over here, seeing that how data analytics can be used in planning all these uh, activities properly in distribution and logistics processes. Now, some of the uh, decisions that can be taken over here through the help of digitization and data analytics, uh, we can decide about the type of supply chain network which is suitable or which can fulfill the requirement. Similarly, the type of transportation mode can be decided and this can be again leveled down to the type of vehicle decisions. Talking about the KPIs, which are again one of the prominent uh, features which the industries track continuously is about transportation cost per unit, order cycle time, on time delivery, inventory turnover rate, on time in full deliveries also called as OTIF in short in today's time. So, we will talk about the, some, uh, the application of KPI in distribution and logistics through this case once again. Suppose we have a company who has decided about a third party logistics for different type of products. So, you can see from here there are three different type of products, modern, semi-modern and a classical product. Their unit cost has been given as rupees 18,000 rupees 14,000 and rupees 9,500 in parallel with that. Now, the company has to decide that which is the right type of logistics company which they can hire. This, these are the third party logistics company. So, suppose we have got two options called as Avi truck and Logitruck and their requirements are also given as minimum shipment size, um, lead time and also the unit transportation cost that they are charging. So, we, have, we are now knowing all these uh, values and now parallelly the demand is assumed to be constant for every week. However, in real life that is not the case. But in order to simplify the problem, we have assumed that demand is constant for every week which is around 150 units per week. The annual inventory carrying cost is considered as 25 percent of unit cost of each product. So, going forward, how do I calculate my transportation cost? 
again transportation cost is dependent on inventory cost as well as the transportation cost together. So, for that purpose we will first calculate the cycle stock. The cycle stock is average of the shipment size. So, in this case it comes around 0.5 into 350 which is around 175 units. Similarly, we will talk about the pipeline inventory which is given with the formula of lead time into demand rate. So, when we use this value from the given case this is coming around 3 week into the demand rate is 150 units per week is already given to us. So, pipeline inventory is coming around 450 units. We are trying to assess logi truck option for the modern product. So, this is my logi truck option for the modern product. So, for this option we are taking up all the value. Now, while we are calculating the total inventory we have to consider both the cycle stock and the pipeline inventory together. Uh, using this value we got the total inventory as 625 units and putting it into our uh, formula for carrying cost we got the values like this. Along with that the total transportation cost is coming around annual demand into transportation per unit and we already have been given uh, with the information of 150 units per week of annual uh, weekly demand into 52 weeks into the transportation cost is 100 rupees per unit. So, when we give this value we can get our total transportation cost. In this way the total cost is a combination of both your annual inventory cost and your annual transportation cost which is coming around 35 lakh 92,500 uh, rupees as the final solution. So, you can see that we have just evaluated one third party logistics service provider only for one type of product. Now, we need to analyze the all possible combination of logistics service provider along with the different type of products. So, we have done this and uh, we have a excel solution for this. So, let me share with you this solution and uh, the excel file for this solution will be shared along with this session. So, you can refer to that excel sheet for more details and uh, the whole analysis is presented over here and we can see that when we have a product of modern product and we analyze the total cost against AV truck and logi truck we found that the minimum cost is coming for the uh, second option that is for logi truck. Similarly, when we have the product of semi modern the minimum cost is coming for AV truck whereas, when we have a classical uh, product the minimum uh, cost is coming for AV truck. So, we can see that using this type of analysis we can easily decide that which third party logistics company is suitable for your given uh, problem. Coming up to the last process of, cust uh, of supply chain which is on customer service this is a very critical uh, um, process as it drives the whole supply chain and it always focuses on providing the support to the customer. Most important expectation from the customer end for this particular process is that there should be effective communication and the um, customer is able to track the products very uh, on a real time basis. The responsiveness is another expectation from the customer end and finally, uh, the customers always expect very high quality product and services. So, what is the scope of digitization in supply chain for the customer service practices? We can see that if we have uh, properly enabled digitization services in supply chain, the inventory management will improve, the response time is can be uh, further improved which will again attract more and more customer. Uh, the expectation of customers about transparency and visibility with the help of tracking orders can be easily achieved and most importantly the reverse logistics that is the expectation related to returns, refunds or exchange can be managed efficiently. So, that is why the role of digitization is improving in supply chain with respect to the customer service uh, requirements. In terms of KPIs for the inventory management which we are referring these are some of the KPIs which are uh, monitored very carefully by any business because this directly tracks the customer expectation. Some of these KPIs are order fulfillment cycle time, 
ऑन टाइम डिलीवरी परफॉर्मेंस फिल रेट रिटर्न रेट सप्लायर ऑन टाइम डिलीवरी एंड कंप्लाइंसेज ऑफ सर्विस लेवल एग्रीमेंट्स वेन वी टॉक अबाउट फिल रेट फिल रेट इज नथिंग बट इट इज द परसेंटेज ऑफ द कस्टमर डिमांड दैट इज फुलफिल्ड इमिडिएटली फ्रॉम स्टॉक विदाउट एनी बैक ऑर्डर्स और विदाउट एनी डीलेज एंड ऑल्सो इट एंश्योर्स दैट द प्रोडक्ट इज अवेलेबल फॉर द कस्टमर Similarly, when we talk about the return rate, this is nowadays gaining huge attention. Reason being, people are shifting towards online uh, shopping, and that's why return rate is uh, having a uh, huge importance in the e-commerce world. So, when we talk about return rate, it is the percentage of products which is returned by the customers, and how efficiently these returns are processed will give a nice experience to the customers as well. similarly there are so many other kpis which customers can target on a day to day basis let us try to analyze some kpi for customer service as well so we have imagine we have a soap producer who who makes soap bars and uh, provides to it to neighborhood shops so we have the data for this particular soap bar manufacturer and we can see that these are the details which are available to us this includes that how many total soap bars are ordered how many soap bars are delivered on time and what is the perfect order rate similarly what is the total monthly operating cost total delivery cost supplier deliveries and supplier on time deliveries so using this data let us try to calculate some kpis for the given process so we have we want to calculate on time delivery we want to calculate delivery cost per soap bar and also we want to calculate supplier on time delivery rate so using this given data let us try to calculate the first uh, kpi which is on time delivery which talks about on time delivery using the given data we can see that it is coming around 90% so we can interpret that the soap manufacturer is able to deliver around 90% of the soap bars maybe uh, on time or maybe before the promised delivery date so what is the meaning of this statistic it actually indicates that 90% of the soap bars are delivered before uh, either on time or before time and that is what it can it ensures that the organization is actually able to do uh, excellent job of fulfilling the given order on time similarly let's talk about the second kpi which is delivery cost per soap bar which is again a very important kpi which needs to be tracked to compare the different option so here this is calculated as total delivery cost divided by total soap bar delivered we can see that for the given case this is coming around rupees 0.56 soap per bar so how does that can be interpreted it simply means that the shipping fee is coming around 0.56 rupees for every soap bar and it actually takes care of cost involved in transporting the goods to the client so we can easily compare uh, uh, for different options if we can calculate this delivery cost per soap bar using this method the third kpi which we are trying to demonstrate over here is about supplier on time delivery rate which ensures that the suppliers who are responsible for providing the raw material on time to the manufacturer how critical uh, they are able to fulfill their requirements so it calculates basically the supplier's performance you can see from this kpi and it is given as supplier on time deliveries divided by the number of deliveries made by the supplier in this case it is coming around 93.75 percentage which says that the soap manufacturers suppliers are have delivered the raw material on time uh, maybe around uh, 93.75% per percentage of the time which shows a good performance of the suppliers so with this we have covered different processes of the supply chain which has which includes from uh, the beginning of the supply chain process till the end and we have gone into the details of each and every process we have seen the scope of digitization in all of these processes and how the data can be captured what type of analysis analysis can be done in these processes and finally we have observed different kpis of against these processes 
and we have seen different cases which are trying to demonstrate about these KPIs in different possible business scenario. With this, we will end our first module and thank you for your patience. We believe that the for basics of supply chain are now uh, we have covered so far and from this point onwards, we will be moving to the second module on supply chain segmentation. Thank you everyone.